Sylvia Plath wrote a letter to her mother, and in it she stated, Blue is my new colour. And so um, Ted Hughes writes this poem, Red, as a response to this idea, um, and he is presenting a different perspective of, of Plath. She's saying she's blue, and Hughes is saying, no, she's red. And also, you know, this is a response to Plath's use of colour imagery in her own poetry to construct that representation of her identity. And so what Hughes is doing is he is um, reframing, he's appropriating her style as a means of interrogating her truth. I think that's a really uh, nice idea, the interrogation of truth as a way of um, looking at the textual conversations. You know, we've been talking about perspective in other tutorials uh, and, um, uh, you know, the fallibility of memory. I think that um, this this idea of poetry is a medium by which we can interrogate truth and come to the understanding that there is no one absolute truth that um, you know your own personal context uh, um, plays plays quite heavily in your understanding of what truth is and that's what um, Hughes is presenting in this poem so while he is um, using apostrophe like here, talking directly to his, his dead wife, he's really more interested in the bigger picture of, of um, this notion of truth. And we've seen it in other poems too, where he's talking about power and um, fate and things like that. So we're really looking for those bigger ideas, trying to move away from the personal um, politics of, of the poetry and look at the, the bigger ideas. So... Um, I suppose he says red was your colour, and here what Hughes is um, saying is that um, he thinks that that you know um, by looking at red as a colour that's symbolic of blood and danger and conflict, he's able to distance himself from the the blame that that the peanut munching crowd are, are placing upon him, saying, you know, in the shot, he was saying it was fate. Nothing would have changed her course. Um, and, and so we can read it as him distancing himself, but I think he's taking a bit of a sort of more um, distanced philosophical sort of approach to, to looking at her view of the world compared to his. And that, that's what creates the conflict and that, that's what creates the interest in the, the conversation and why we keep studying it. So, red was your colour. A, a um, end stop line, it's short, it's, it's, um, it's a definite, it's an emphatic statement. He's stating the facts. This is his, his view of it. If not red, then white. So now he's even questioning that and saying, well, you know, um, sometimes you were white, but red was what you wrapped around you, blood red. Was it blood? Was it red ochre for the warming of the dead? Hermitite to make immortal the precious heirloom bones, the family bones. So, um, you know, right from the opening line and, and certainly in the opening stanza, there's a strong um, association, connotation with blood and um you know and red can symbolize passion and romance and love um and, and certainly the blood coursing around in your veins um has has a role in that too so um <clears throat> it's it's just interesting to um to keep that in mind as as we start to explore the poem because there's a lot of blood imagery um used um Plath uses a lot of um references to white and bones and Hughes here is using it as a metaphor for her preoccupation with death and also her preoccupation with her father's death as well. Um, <clears throat> so there are different shades of red um, is the idea that's come across and they're used for, for different things. When you had your way, finally our room was red, a judgment cha chamber. So here um, not often do we see um, this this personal notion of we or our. It's normally you and I. And so here Hughes is um, lamenting the loss of of her life and and the impact that her 
her actions had on their relationship. So what was there is this now been separated. And that line in purple, a judgment chamber, you've got that short um, statement there. <clears throat> and, um, you know, th th there's a lot of blame being being cast on Hughes for his role in the the, um, the downfall of, of Plath in her death. It was a shut casket for gems. So this is a, an interesting idea and focusing on this <clears throat> notion of gems, you know, things that were so precious, but the casket is shut. It's like, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the coffin is closed and it's, it's never going to be reopened. Now we see a whole lot of blood imagery. The carpet of blood patterned with darkenings, congealments, the curtains, ruby corduroy blood, sheer blood falls from ceiling to floor, the cushions the same, the same raw carmine along the window seat, a throbbing cell, Aztec altar, temple. So um, here we've got, you know, all these words associated with with blood um, and, and really... Um, you know, the idea is to show that, that um, there is a, 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 an association with death and suffering. The room, um, the whole room with the curtains and the carpet and everything, the cushions are all, they're all associated with death and suffering. And this really speaks to Plath's poem, um, A Birthday Present. You know, at the start of the poem, early on, she says, when I'm quiet at my cooking, I feel it looking, I feel it thinking. So she's using that internal rhyme to emphasise her, um, her thoughts of suicide, that it's always lurking there. And she um, talks about the um, women suffering under the confines of domesticity, you know, measuring the flower, cutting off the surplus, adhering to the rule, to rules, to rules, to rules. And, you know, so the rules um, just reinforces um, the the domestic roles and the suffering that, that is, is caused from having these um, very um, conservative views of um, women's roles. So Plath is saying in a birthday present that, that the home um, is a place of, of um, personal suffering and Hughes reshapes that and says, well, the bedroom, it's the bedroom that's the place of suffering and, you know, um, it's, it's the place where... Um, should have been a uh, a place of intimacy and and love, but it's become a prison, and he 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 can't escape the assertions that he's responsible for that. And this Aztec altar, you know, is is um, really highlighting that that it's a place of sacrifice and suffering and and punishment when it should rather be a place of intimacy. And, and so um, we, we see that, um, we, you know, we, we see that difference of uh, view there, uh, you know, and this is Hughes's, Hughes's uh, version of events. Only the bookshelves have escaped into whiteness. So here, you know, that, that the whiteness being about purity and innocent and escape, I suppose, um, and saying that's the only part... <clears throat> That, that's the suggestion that literature is the escape, the respite. Um, and we can read that that is for him, but also for her. And outside the window. So here I think this is a nice little metaphor saying that, you know, looking from the outside, people can see what's going on and they have their view of the reality, but that quite often it's different when you're on the inside. And I think this is what Hughes is saying here, that, that he's, um, <clears throat> he's been the um, scapegoat and all these assertions have been made about him, but it's people from the outside looking in. They don't have the full picture, um, so they don't know the real truth. So Poppy's thin and wrinkled, frail, so... Poppies are red, red flowers, so that blood is still there as the skin on blood. Salvias, which are red flowers that your father named you after, like blood lobbing from the gash. That's a really strong, powerful image, isn't it? Of, of um, you know, an artery being cut and the blood, blood spurting everywhere, and you know, you sort of 
associate that with probably wrists and necks and um, you know it's, it's very powerfully presented and roses the heart's last gouts the last drops of blood the last aspects of romance um, are tainted by by uh, Plath and her, her, her dark ideas and then I've put Caesura there but um, maybe Ascenton is better C catastrophic arterial doomed so um, you know it, it really is highlighting the the devastating nature of of Plath's version of of love and romance and life and that type of thing okay I'll move this up <clears throat> your velvet long full skirt a swathe of blood a lavish burgundy your lips dipped a deep crimson you reveled in red so here we've got another one of these um, end stop lines it's um, very definitive and the alliteration also <clears throat> emphasizes her obsession with death really factual to the point it felt raw like a crisp gauze edges of a stiffening wound I could touch the open vein in it the crust of gleam so here now we're starting to get Hughes's perspective and that you know it was really uh, a, a, a um, it wounded him deeply it was a very raw experience for him and he could touch he could touch it right you know the, the pain he could feel it very uh, viscerally everything you painted you painted white <clears throat> so here he's suggesting that she attempted to be calm and innocent and these type of things but then splashed it with roses with dripping roses weeping roses and more roses so um, you know, she, her, can, her moods would would move from high to low, and everything she did, she did at a hundred miles an hour, and things were, I don't know if exaggerated is the right word, but but certainly overdone, and sometimes among them a little bluebird, okay, and so here we're we're back to this idea of blue, and um, you know that there were times he was saying when she was calm she was reflective passive and and very grounded and at peace at peace with things and that's what he he certainly uh, preferred blue was better for you blue was wings that allowed her to be free it gave her flight in her poems you know this talks to a couple of her poems where you know like in lady lazarus she rises out of the ashes um, <clears throat> there's another one there's a couple couple references in her poems one she's a Japanese lantern flying away you know flying up into the sky and it's that weightlessness that she's rising up above and and certainly I think that's what he's um, speaking to there kingfisher blue silks from San Francisco folded your pregnancies in crucible caresses okay and so here, you know, this is talking to Nick and the candlestick where, you know, um, <clears throat> that she was a, a, a blue flame and, and that, that Nick provided her with, with um, you know, positivity and strength and the will to, to go on. Blue was your kindly spirit, not a ghoul, but electrified, a guardian, thoughtful. Okay, so here was the, the, the time in their relationship where things were were, were um, <clears throat> at their best in the pit of red so we've got this uh, the last few lines in the pit of red you hid from the bone clinic whiteness so you know um, her escape I suppose um, or her her mental state when she was um, you know in a depressive state um, it, it avoided her you know she she wasn't able to to um, you know um, I don't know how to express it really but she was she was unable to um, be more calm and and have that connection to um, innocence and purity and happiness and you know stability and connection those type of things okay that was the the blunt harsh reality of her depression but the jewel you lost was blue 
And I think, you know, here, you know, I think we were talking at the start that, you know, that it is this, the, the most precious thing and that, that what, what she really lost, um, was that, um, the, the, the wonderful times, the, 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 um, fam, the moments with family and, and, um, all those wonderful things that, that, um, come from, from sharing time with family. And, and I think that this idea of jewel speaks to other poems as well. So, um, I think it's in, um, uh, I think it's in Lady Lake Lazarus where, you know, I might just go and have a look. Yes, it was Lady Lazarus where she um, uses that um, a cake of soap, a wedding ring, a gold filling, you know, referencing the Holocaust imagery. And um, and then Hughes uses that in the shop, doesn't he? A wisp of your hair, your ring, your watch, your nightgown. So the 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 wedding ring, I think, and the jewel is um, the thing of most value. And here Hughes is saying, well, it's not a, a materialistic thing. It's it's the love and the the um, connection to family is the thing that that she lost. The other thing I was thinking too, um, I just had a quick look, and um, it's Fever One O Three where she talks about herself as um, my head, a moon of Japanese paper and she says i think i'm i think i am going up i think i may rise and so um there's that idea of ascending ascendance you know rising out of the sins of society and 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 so that that speaks to this poem as well so there are a lot of um really interesting ideas in this poem and beyond the personal i think what we're able to see is that that truth is complex and that there are um, there are things that that um, you know inhibit us from from understanding the truth clearly because it involves a multiplicity of of different perspectives <laughs>